we'll start we'll start with an introduction right now it's already 10 01 and we have quite a few of you on here um so whoever's left is going to trickle in eventually i'm sure so but um hi everybody i am oh just another admit another person um i'm Amber martinez i'm with computer systems plus and we're an it company in south knoxville and i'm on the board the, the west 140 committee um with as long as well as with um, the rest of the committee members that are on here. We have Taylor Hensley, Chloe Poole, Cody Barnes, and Adrian Hall. And we also have Jared Butler. And I wanted to, uh, we all wanted to plan uh, an, a really cool event this year for the, to start off 2021 on a really good note. And we decided that it would be resilience. Um, as all of you have really endured this last, the last year and so we found Anna Rappaport, and she is a fantastic person to have hosting this event. She is um, the founder and principal of Excellence Coaching. She's a former lawyer with 20 years of experience coaching professionals on leadership and business development and career strategy. She publishes regularly on the ABA's Law Practice Today magazine and other bar publications. And she speaks around the country on various career and business development topics. Um, so Anna, if you want to take it away and just, we're super excited about this event and getting ready to just build strategies for this next year of getting all of our, achieving all of our goals and dreams. Thank you. Thanks Amber for the introduction. Um, I guess I'll just go ahead and get started <clears throat> with my slides. Um, I'm going to shut off the, I'm not going to look at the chat right now. So if there's something urgent, feel free to interrupt me. I don't mind that at all. But other than that, I'm not going to be looking at that because I'm just going to be looking at the, um, uh, doing the, the screen share. So. All right, do you guys see it? Okay, great, thanks. So um, welcome <laughs> to Fed Up With Coronavirus, tips and tools to help you cope uh, with challenges and build resilience. So obviously given what we're all dealing with right now, the focus is going to be COVID uh, and just dealing with you know working from home and isolation and fear of the unknown and all that kind of stuff. But the truth is that resilience, as I'm sure you're all aware, is relevant for pretty much every aspect of life and career, right? So as Amber said, I've been coaching for over 20 years and I work primarily with clients on career issues, right? Including leadership and business development. Um, but, you know, resilience is a topic that comes up all the time in coaching. Right, it takes resilience to keep on job searching, right? When you're not getting any traction, right? It takes uh, a lot of resilience to be a leader, to keep on pushing forward uh, when you're trying to change an organization. Uh, so even though on the surface, you might think resilience, you know, that maybe resilience is more something that therapists deal with, but really it's an intrinsic part of coaching and something that I deal with all the time. So I'm just going to share today. Um, oh, sorry. Here we go. Um, so I'm going to share with you a few things today. First, we're going to start with uh, what is resilience, right? What are we even talking about? Uh, then I'm going to talk to you about um, some scientifically validated uh, approaches for, uh, for enhancing resilience. Now, I've particularly focused on these two approaches because they have so much research that, that uh, validates them. So some of you um, I'm sure are familiar with, there's a lot of research out there saying exercise is helpful, right? To enhance resilience or that meditation is helpful. So I think people are very familiar with those kinds of strategies. So I've chosen some things that are less popular, less well-known, but that are extremely helpful. So uh, then finally, what we're going to do is we're going to go through a goal setting exercise together. 
So with all the limitations that we are facing nowadays, it can be kind of hard to plan and make goals for the coming year. So I'm going to provide some guidance and we can talk through uh, some of the ways uh, to approach that. So what is resilience? Oh, didn't move forward. Sorry. Um, I'm, I set up a I'm using a different setup today and things got a little off. All right, so what is resilience, right? It's the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, right? There's many things that help a person's resilience, right? Being part of a supportive community that will reach out and help you, right? Financial resources obviously are helpful. Being physically healthy, obviously that helps, right? So there's a lot of external things that support a person's resilience in the sense that you know, it makes it easier to bounce back from difficulties. However, when we're talking about resilience, usually we are referring to the internal game, right? The person's ability to manage their thoughts and emotions, as well as to cope, you know, using those things to cope with challenges. So fundamentally, when you think about it, resilience is about how you react to and recover from stress, right? Stress then is a function of two things. And people don't normally think about it this way, but I think it's helpful to parse it out, right? Stress is a function of how much control you think you have in the present and then how you view the future. And these exercises I'm talking about today are both uh, directly address those aspects of stress. So I know you already have a lot of strategies for dealing with stress or bouncing back from setbacks. And for those of you who are on uh, this meeting a little bit early, you got to hear some strategies. Uh, but I thought some of them were so great. I'd love to just make sure that everyone has a chance to hear these. Um, who would be willing to share uh, one of your strategies for coping with stress or things that you've been doing during the pandemic that have uh, made you feel more alive. And you can go ahead and unmute yourselves. Um, as you probably noticed, this is a meeting format, so you can go ahead and just speak up whenever you're ready. I'll share. <clears throat> so um, I've been working from home all year. I mentioned this to the people who were on a little bit early. And for me, I, I started off by thinking, oh, I'll just take a long walk on my lunch break. That will kind of give me some fresh air and help me clear my mind. But I realized that it didn't give me enough breaks through the day. So I started to every two hours, take like a 15 minute walk instead of kind of having that all happen within an hour span only once throughout the day. Um, so that for me was just a huge, knowing that every two hours I could kind of decompress from being inside my house all day was very helpful. Great, thanks. Who else be willing to share something? Even if you just say something quick, right? Like talking to friends or, you know, whatever it is. What is, let's just get like two more, two more examples of strategies that you're already using to reduce stress. I love cooking, so uh, cooking is a stress reliever for me. Excellent. Thanks. Anna, for me, I think uh, stress is about pre-planning, and so carving out time um, each week to think about um, immediate needs or tasks that I have to do, and then also um, those longer terms. So coming up with a plan is important. Absolutely. Planning can be a huge stress relief, right? Because then you have the clarity of where you're going and actions and things like that. Great. Thank you. So, um, so to become even more resilient, right? We have, there's two basic approaches to become more resilient. First, you can use the strategies you already have, because we all know just because we have a strategy doesn't mean we always use it. Right, so it's actually using the things you already have in your toolbox. And then the other option is expanding your toolbox. So the next thing I'm going to be sharing is intended to perhaps expand your toolbox. Um, all right, so the next thing we're gonna look at is attributional styles. So uh, attributional styles are really about the tendency, 
I do not know what's going on. This was working perfectly yesterday. Um, I apologize. I'm having technical difficulties here. No worries. We all have technical difficulties with Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. Okay, so um, so the tendency is to view events from a predominantly optimistic or predominantly pessimistic perspective. So Martin Seligman, who you may have heard of, is the father of positive psychology, which focuses on how to make people happier, more optimistic, more successful, right, rather than focusing on mental illness and what's wrong with people right, which was more the focus of traditional psychology, right? How many of you think of yourselves as optimists? And how many think of yourselves as pessimists? And how many of you are maybe somewhere in between? Right, so, I mean, optimism and pessimism are fairly old, old concepts, right? And what Martin Seligman and others like him have done is that they've really parsed it out and analyzed it so that rather than being a fixed characteristic, like you're tall, you're short, right? Like that this is more of a spectrum. It's more of a malleable thing that you can actually improve your, your pessim, excuse me, enhance your optimism. Usually you're not trying to become more pessimistic. That's <laughs> one might, but not usually, right? So your attributional style is, it's really like your first instinct in terms of how to explain things when you're faced with adversity, right? So it doesn't mean that you necessarily stick with that interpretation. So for example, if you're interviewed for a job, but they choose someone else, your initial thought might be, oh, I really messed up the job interview. I'm so terrible at this, right? Like that would be an indication of a more pessimistic attributional style. However, if you have people in your life who help you reframe it, or if you just have practice shifting that for yourself, you may be able to then go back and shift your interpretation, right? You start to realize, well, maybe I just wasn't the best fit for that particular job, you know, but there's plenty of other jobs out there that I would be a good fit for. Right, so it, this is really not black and white. It's a spectrum. You're not a pessimist or an optimist, you're a human being. And there are going to be moments where you're more optimistic or more pessimistic, right? But the thing to remember though, is that optimism does lead to greater resilience. So, Okay, um, so what is the difference between optimism and pessimism, right? So when the research researchers parse it out, what exactly did they see? Optimists believe that defeat is just a temporary setback, right? That its causes are confined to this one case, right? The optimists also believe that defeat is not their fault, right? Circumstances, bad luck, or other people brought it about. Right, confronted by a bad situation, they perceive it as a challenge and they try harder, right? Optimists see events as circumstantial, right? This is sort of the summary. <laughs> they see it as circumstantial, meaning that it isn't you, it's the circumstances. Temporary, meaning that this problem won't last that long. And specific, meaning it's isolated to that issue. So maybe rather than thinking that now the world is in for a series of pandemics or other disasters, you think of COVID as it's a one-time thing and pretty soon it'll get back to normal. So the defining characteristic of pessimists is that they tend to believe that bad events is going to be, they're going to last a long time, right? They're gonna undermine everything you do and it's their own fault. So pessimists basically see adverse circumstances as personal rather than circumstantial, permanent or, or pervasive, right? So it's not just this one issue, like the problems are just gonna keep on coming. Um, so what this, what this is about really is looking at what the cycle looks like, right? Why pessimism leads to negative outcomes. So um, when you think about it, if you are feeling Right, if you habitually believe, like as one does when one's in a pessimistic mindset, that misfortune is our own fault 
and it's enduring, it's going to undermine everything you do, right? And that leads to more misfortune, right? You feel unmotivated, which means that you're probably not working as hard as you would otherwise. Or even if you are working hard, it's, you're just, there's a bit of a drag, right? You just don't have the vim and vigor that you would otherwise. So if you're not working as hard or being as focused, that's going to lead to worse outcomes, which can lead to feeling depressed and more pessimistic, right? So it's this downward spiral in contrast to optimism, which leads to an upward spiral, right? There's more motivation, more effort, better outcomes, right? So the good news, though, is that we can learn to be more optimistic. And this is about this exercise that we can do. It's called the three P's exercise. So what you do is you pick, um, you're gonna pick an adverse circumstance, right? So we could, obviously we could start with the pandemic. Um, I'm gonna invite you, I don't know if people are willing to do this. It's, it's, it can feel a little bit awkward, but we'll just see if people are open to it. Um, what you do with this exercise is you write down at least one of your negative interpretations, right? And then you identify that interpretation as like, what is going on with that interpretation? Is it personal, permanent, pervasive? Here, I'll give you an example um, for my own life. I'll, this is something that happened this morning. This is not uncommon, but this is specifically from this morning. So I woke up this morning and um, the, this, my stepkids are supposed to do the dishes, right? They take turns, they're supposed to do the dishes. And uh, one of them did not do all the dishes. He did one of the pans, but not the other one, right? And where does my mind go? He is a lazy bum. That is, the, what, that is what came into my mind. Now, of course that's ridiculous, right? You'll notice that he is a lazy bum is both permanent and pervasive, <laughs> right? It's permanent because it's, it's attributed a character. You know, it's like a character trait. Right, and it's pervasive because it's I generalized it. Right, it's not just about the dish; it's about general laziness, which of course is, you know, it's it's a bit extreme, right? So I mean, so I sat back and said, okay, let me do this. The, since I'm doing this presentation today, it's foremost in my mind. Let me do the little P, three P's exercise on this because it's not very constructive, right? To be Think, to be categorizing people in this way. So, you know, maybe he didn't see the other dish or maybe he was feeling tired or maybe I haven't clearly defined my expectations, right? So that's essentially, the point here is to be able to notice the personal permanent or pervasiveness of the assessment, right? Because usually usually we, we, we generalize to such a degree that we don't have any perspective on it. But once you're able to parse it out to one of those three things, you can then step back and then sort of fix it, right? Does that all make sense? So I'll give you um, some further examples. Um, so what you would do so this is what it might look like with changing the interpretations. So a personal interpretation might be, I am a terrible parent, right? Or I don't interview well. When you then shift it to a circumstantial, uh, the circumstantial interpretation, it's okay, coronavirus is making parenting extremely difficult, right? Or it's a tough job market right now, both of which are logical and reasonable, right? You notice this is not like lying to yourself or even like uh, like sort of a blind affirmation, right? You're not saying I'm a terrible parent. No, I'm a great parent, right? You're actually just bringing it back. You're bringing it down from sort of a more generalized negativity to something more positive, but more specifically grounded in reality. Uh, the next thing is for permanent, right? So the world will never get back to normal, which we all know is not true, but I'm sure many of us might have had this sort of thought now and again, right? Or I'm never gonna get better at this. Say you're trying to do some new endeavor and you're frustrated because it's not going that well, right? You might have the feeling, ah, oh, I'm never gonna get better. But the truth is, um, or the, the more temporary and more accurate interpretation is probably once the vaccine is distributed, right? The economy is gonna bounce back or my skills are improving. Right? Again, grounded much more in, in reality. Then there's the examples of pervasive. 
right? Like I don't have enough experience to get a good job, right? As opposed to maybe I don't have an experience, enough experience to get this particular job, right? It's not everything, it's just this specific situation, um, right? It, maybe it's not appropriate for job A, but it would work for job B. So that is, we probably don't have time to go through that particularly, but um, before I move on, because I'm just kind of sharing some tools with you right now, and I'd be happy to send the slides if you want. Um, but are there any questions? I know we don't have any questions, but if anyone wants to just unmute themselves and have a comment or a question, feel free. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about is expressive writing. So in the 1980s, James Pennebaker, who's a psychology professor at the University of Texas at Austin, he started doing research on this writing technique and discovered that simply writing about tumultuous emotional experiences helped undergraduate students have better health outcomes. Right? So just writing for 15 minutes a day, four days in a row, reduced their illnesses by 50% over the following, following six months. So since this study was first published, like hundreds, and even now this is years later, so it might even be up to thousands, right, of additional studies have been conducted that really show how effective um, this technique is. And they have documented better health, health outcomes for PTSD, for phobias, asthma, arthritis, wounds heal faster, they reduce fatigue and pain for fibromyalgia, Crohn's disease, like it, it's really countless, <laughs> the number of different uh, sort of health conditions that they've addressed around this. Um, and they've even addressed things like cancer and stuff like that, but um, I mean, what they find in general is that if people have sort of more moderate illness, it can help, but you know, really serious illnesses, as you would imagine, it's not like this is going to cure cancer. Um, however, um, it does maybe mar on the margins help improve outcomes. Uh, the researchers also did this exercise with people who were abruptly laid off um, after an average of 30 years in their company. Right, so these are this group of people who are older, they're really expected to have a very tough time finding a new job. And within three months of the layoff, right, those who did not do, like those who did not do the exercise, only 5% of them had found new jobs. Meanwhile, 27% of the group that did, they did the exercise right, they found new jobs, meaning they were more than five times more successful in their job search, right, than the control group, right. Similarly, um, by the seven month mark, 53% of those who did the expressive writing found jobs compared to only 18% of the control group, right. So this may sound kind of wild or sort of too good to be true, but the reason they think that this simple exercise has had such a profound impact on health and other things is because the writing process really helps people to process emotions, right? And that in turn significantly reduces stress. So um, what it's really about <laughs> is taming your lizard brain, <laughs> right? The right prefrontal cortex is involved in the conscious control of emotional states Right? And when there's really strong negative emotions, generally that triggers the amygdala, right? It's called the lizard brain, right? This is the fight or flight part of the brain that hijacks everything else and then causes us not to be able to think rationally. However, thanks to modern, modern brain imaging technology, right? They've discovered that a negative experience, when a negative experience is processed using the thinking part of the brain, it actually takes over from the lizard brain, right? So like the processing goes from like back here in the lizard brain to the forebrain. They like watch this on, you know, the brain imaging. So, um, I mean, I'm sure that many of you have had this experience, right? That when you're upset about something and you process it uh, verbally, right? Whether through writing or through, you know, speaking, right? It actually helps you calm down and deal with things in a rational way. 
um, right? That whole use your words thing that people say to little kids, right? Like it's based on something because um, once you put the emotional experiences into language, that sort of gives the front part of your brain jurisdiction over it, essentially. So maybe you're thinking, hey, I talk to friends, I journal, I'm all set, right? Um, maybe, <laughs> but there's a lot of different ways of journaling. And uh, it's, whereas this format is, is a little more specific than that. Um, Uh, so of course, of course, you need to pick a topic, right? So traditionally express, expressive writing focuses on an event from the past, right? Um, but there's evidence that it can also be effective addressing something that's going on currently, like the pandemic, right? You could use it on homeschooling, right? There's a lot of different things you could use it on. Um, I'm gonna share my own personal experience with this, um, which may give you some perspective. Um, so early on in the pandemic, like in March, maybe April, I was feeling really anxious around the pandemic, right? To a degree that seemed pretty irrational um, given my circumstances, right? Like I wasn't particularly at risk. I wasn't particularly, there wasn't, you know, particular financial fear or anything like that. But, you know, when I thought about it, I realized that the experience of it, sort of the overwhelm and, you know, the uncertainty about the future and all of the, that, those sorts of feelings, it felt a lot like when my mother was sick, right? When I was really young and everything felt really scary and out of control. Everyone sooner or later, right, has experiences in their personal lives where something devastating happens, right? That just shakes your foundation. And, you know, I had done a lot of emotional work around this. And, you know, I didn't really think it was an issue anymore. Um, and yet I noticed, you know, in the face of the pandemic, kind of all these kinds of fears and upsets were, you know, were, were coming up in a, in a way that seemed a little strange to me, right? So I went ahead and did this exercise. Um, you know, I went ahead and did the four days in a row and the right, you know, the writing and all of this, and it really reduced the anxiety, right? That's what it's supposed to do, but I will just say <laughs> I'm a little testimonial <laughs> specific to the pandemic. This worked really well. So for anyone who's feeling like the pandemic or, you know, the, the political craziness or really anything that's happening right now is stirring up anything, you know, emotional upsets from the past, this is a great way to address it. So that is to say that you could think of this either as focusing specifically on what's happening now, or to the degree that it sort of harkens back to something from the past, you can address that thing in the past. So the way to do this is you write for 15 or 20 minutes for four days in a row. You write by hand. Right. And so this is really important. It might seem very counterintuitive, especially to people who are on the younger end of the spectrum. Right. But it's because it slows down your thinking and helps you to process the thoughts and emotions in a new way. Right. Because part of this, it's not just that you're sending this to the, the forebrain, you know, the, the thinking part of the brain. It's also that you're creating kind of new pathways. Right. And it's easier to do that when you slow it down. So you write continuously without worrying about grammar, spelling, editing, anything like that. And you write only for yourself, right? Nobody else needs to read it. It's really just completely for you. Um, so the thing to remember is that it's also, it's not just that you're writing each day, you're writing according to a different prompt. So the first day you write entirely from your perspective just write the way you might be normally thinking about it or talking about it. The second day you write about that same event, but you write about the big picture, right? Like how it fits into history, society, the economy, trends, right? All the big picture issues. The third day you write from the perspective of someone else. Um, so, you know, if you're writing about an incident where maybe something went wrong with the client, right? You might be writing from the client's perspective 
or even if you're writing about a situation where there was someone who, who acted really terribly, right? Like some of the examples they use um, when talking about the, this technique are, you know, when people have been in active shooter situations, right? Like you, so you th people have used this technique for like really scary, dramatic, you know, situations. And um, that's, you know, so that's a really important piece of this that you really want to get it from another person's perspective. Um, whether that person, you know, really deserves, <laughs> you know, so, someone who it, it's really kind of almost hard to get in that person's mind. That's, a, that's an ideal thing to do. Sometimes, of course, maybe this situation is nobody's fault, but it's still, even still, you want to look at it from someone else's perspective, just somebody outside of yourself. And then the final one is you're imagining that you're hundred years old and looking back on your life. And you're looking at, okay, what lessons did you learn from that event or situation? So really putting it in the big picture. So this exercise really takes something. I mean, I think the real, given the remarkable level of effectiveness that this exercise has been shown to have, I think the reason that people don't use it more is because it really takes discipline, right? Like if you're participating in a study, sure, you're gonna show up and do what you're supposed to do in the study, which is to do the writing. But, you know, it, it can be harder for an individual to sit down and, and do that. But, you know, for anyone who might be feeling extremely distressed or having moments where they're feeling extremely distressed, this is just, I just wanna offer this as a tool you know, should one feel so inclined? Because, you know, when it comes to deeply emotional issues, right, our minds get stuck in a rut and the simple process really helps people break out of that. Um, I'm gonna move on to the goal setting in a minute. Are there, are there any questions about this? Got a comment. Um, as a creative, <laughs> I'm always trying to push uh, things out of the way that are blocking creativity. And there's a lot of studies on this exact technique, this exact thing to open up creativity. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Yep, like the writer's way and stuff like that. They're the artist's way, I'm thinking, um, for example. But yeah, absolutely. It, I mean, it, it certainly clears the mind. That is, that is a, 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 an important element of this. I mean, I think the, the other really important element of this is um, the fact that you are able to think about things in a different way, which tends to free you up, right? I mean, you can get that from just sort of general writing in journal or, you know, just from a whole host of techniques, but the fact that you are sort of very consciously taking this from different angles tends to also kind of loosen up whatever the kind of emotional stuck places are. Um, Thanks for that comment. Any other comments? All right. So um, the next thing <laughs> um, is we're going to talk about goal setting. So um, I understand that uh, Amber or someone else on the leadership team reached out to ask what resilience related topics people were particularly interested in. And I gather that a lot of people wanted to talk about how to plan for the future, right? When the pandemic seems to be cutting off so many options. Um, so I figured uh, we could kind of talk through goal setting together. Um, I'm wondering who would be willing to share something that you wanted to do this year but that maybe felt that it's feeling kind of impossible for one reason or another. Would people be willing to share something that like, that you would want, but that you just feel like, ah, oh, in the face of the pandemic, if, if no one's ready to share, I'll, I can go on to my examples, but I think it's more fun if we can, you know, hear from different people. I'll share. Um... This year, I was supposed to have an August 15th destination wedding that did not go as planned. So we ended up um, canceling that and then getting married, just our parents and siblings. But I was like, well, we still have our honeymoon to look forward to. But now that still hasn't been open. So that's been like, a, I feel like we're on hold because I want to do all this stuff, but I want to do our honeymoon. And then so that's been one that's been 
a little tough to navigate and it's on other people's time and not my time. What a great example. Yeah. Yes. So uh, wedding and honeymoon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a real bummer. I'm sorry about that. I know it's like everyone has their own things that are getting put off because of the pandemic, but that's, that's a great example. Uh, who else would be willing to share something you've been wanting to do and sort of an ideal goal that just isn't feeling feasible right now? So I lead a young professionals group that's for just my industry. Um, municipal utilities. Um, so we, <laughs> there was a group that was planning a summit that was supposed to happen in, first it was the fall, then we delayed to the spring. And now obviously there's more delays. Um, so just kind of, I think the part that mentally has been the biggest challenge is knowing how much we've planned already because we had already put a lot of planning into it and trying to decide how to, when to roll out the information about it. Can we safely put it on, you know, November and hope that that will end up working out? Um, just all the uncertainty of trying to make that decision now about something that who knows kind of what vaccine rollouts and all of that is gonna look like. It, there's been times in the process where yes. it has felt like it, literally like an impossible decision. So, and that I think has been having to work through that feeling of kind of going back to what you talked about with control. It feels like, it feels like we're out of control. There are things we can control, but it's really easy to let that feeling of just general, there's nothing we can do. We can't make a good decision. It, just yeah. fighting that has been a challenge during this whole process. Yeah, it's really hard, right, to make a choice about the future with there's so much uncertainty. Yeah, that's a great example. Anyone else feel like sharing something? Well, I'll mention a couple um, a couple topics that uh, that I believe were mentioned. Um, one is uh, asking for a raise, right? I mean, that's not a project, but it's certainly something one might wish to do that <laughs> now might not seem like the best time, right? So that's that's something that one might think about. Um, I'll share sort of from my own, uh, my own experience. So my husband and I were thinking that we were going to be empty nesters, right? And that we were could maybe go live abroad because I've lived abroad a few times and he's interested in doing that. So that was something that we thought would be fun that we could do this year or, you know, sort of moving in that direction at the very least. And so the pandemic messed up that plan, right? So the kids are back home and even if they weren't, you know, even if they weren't, right? So living abroad is definitely going to be less fun if you can't, you know, go out <laughs> and do things, right? So, um, it's easy to feel very stymied. So I had to look at the situation and ask myself, like, what is the value that living abroad represents for me? Right? And so for me, the answer is adventure, right? For someone else, it might be different. But for me, it's adventure. So adventure has always been a really core value in my life. Um, I've, you know, lived abroad, I've lived in Turkey and Japan. And um, and Thailand, right? And which was to me, the, the thing that I loved about that was that it was just this adventure. You just never knew it was gonna happen. You meet different people and you know, like it's, it's an adventure. Um, but there's also other adventures, right? Like starting my own business, that's an adventure, right? When I was a child, uh, the way I found adventure was through reading books, right? Because obviously I couldn't like go off and you know, travel to a foreign country on my own. That wasn't really a possibility. So uh, I would read uh, fantasy and science fiction books. So I was exposed to new worlds, new ideas. So, so now, right, given that, given the limitations of the pandemic, what, what I've done is say, okay, so I wanted to live abroad, living abroad's not feasible right now, but what I really wanted was adventure. How else can I create adventure? So I went back and looked at 
um, you know, again, like I mentioned, the childhood, right? Like I got adventure through books. Now I don't, I'm not going to read the same books that I read then, but for me, the project I ended up creating is about sort of reading a certain number of books over the course of the year that expose me to new ideas, new, just things that I didn't know about previously right? Like I'm reading certain things about the medical industry, like just, you know, certain things about, you know, human evolution, like things like that might not sound like an adventure to somebody else, but at least to me, it feels like an, an intellectual adventure, right? And gives me something to talk about other than like, gee, the pandemic sucks, right? So um, the place I'm inviting people to look as you're thinking about you know, how to design goals going forward is, okay, start with the thing that you wanted, right? And then so like for the wedding, a wedding is a great example, right? Because a wedding means different things to different people. So you might look at, okay, what's the value represented by the wedding, right? For some people, maybe it's, for one person, it might be community, right? For someone, it might be celebration. For someone else, it may be, um, uh, just sort of planning the future, right? Because it's sort of a representative of moving into something else. Like there's a lot of ways to think about it. Um, so whatever your, your goal is, right? Like, so for example, the, no one mentioned it here, but I'm told it's, you know, someone mentioned it somewhere previously was the asking for a new job, excuse me, asking for a raise, right? A person might ask for a raise because, uh, because they, they want a nicer home, right? They want more money so they can have a nicer home, right? Someone else might ask for a raise because they really want to feel appreciated. They don't really feel appreciated at their job, right? So you could design a project around, okay, how do I get that sense of appreciation that I really, that, that was meaningful to me? Or how do I make my home nicer even without getting that raise, right? <laughs> so, um, I'd love to, I sort of wanted to keep there as being some time uh, at the end so we could talk through these things. Um, so now that I've been babbling for a while about this, uh, does anyone have any additional uh, sort of goals they feel like sharing or have you noticed what values in particular you might want to create a project around? I'll just start by saying that I absolutely love the way you touch on the fact that your adventure is not necessarily my adventure. We have different ideas and we need to get to the root of what our drive is for that goal. And getting to the root of what the drive is can really help you even get to your goal quicker or get to your goal in a different capacity. Um, Anyone who has a significant other, I'm sure, has talked about vacations, and you and your significant other probably have a totally different view on what adventure you want to go on. Um, and I just really do enjoy that mindset of trying to get back to the root of what fuels me to this. Um, so thank you for that. Sure. Yeah, and I mean, adventure is just my thing right? Like I've designed my life around this. It's not everybody's thing, you know, like everyone has different things that, you know, for some people, like maybe they're feeling really stymied around family because they really, they can't visit their parents or grandparents or, you know, like people are feeling really stuck around that. And I know that plenty of people have, oh, now we do weekly me Zoom meetings with the whole family or, you know, like people have different things that they're doing. Like I know that people are already taking action around, uh, you know, around the things that are important to them. This is just kind of another way of thinking about it to hopefully empower you around those areas where maybe you're not feeling as empowered. Um, does anyone else have a comment or anything that they would like to uh, talk about? Like, I would be delighted to talk through this with someone. If someone, for example, feels like, hey, this is the thing that I really want and I'm having trouble identifying what the under my underlying value is, right? We can talk through that if you don't mind. Um, hey, Anna, this is Nathan Woods, and Hi. thank you for giving us time today. Um, 
like many on this on this meeting, you know, we're working for leaders, hopefully leaders, not bosses, who are older than we are for the most part. Um, and I I changed not careers but changed employers last year, and so a lot of my industry in uh, retirement plan and individual wealth management and advising. You you don't just look out for a 12 month goal or a one year, but actually three, five, 10, both personally and, and corporately. And so with my change, a lot of the goals stayed the same personally, but it's also rebuilding the 10 years worth of goal setting I had previously with, with prior leaders with those at, at the new the new organization and they're receptive to that. But I wonder, you know, in, a, in some ways my goals aren't impossible, but they're, they may be quite different because it's a new organization. And so it wasn't so much pandemic related, but job change related, but it's still, you know, same song, different verse, so to speak. So I, I think, my question will be, how do you help those who um, support you and lead you in an organization, help them understand your, your why for those goals that you've set for yourself, but also be receptive if they have um, different adaptations of those same goals or entirely new ones? So let me just make sure I, I'm understanding. So are you feeling like you're like what you think you want or what direction you're feeling like you should be well, going? Is for for me, it's, for me, it's like, um, so I'm six months in here and I've worked with these folks for a decade now, but it's also, I have six months of internal rapport behind the goals that I have versus the 10 years of success and, and evidence that I had where I was previously. And so, just how to how to best relay that with leadership um, as we re, almost start rebuilding in, in new goals, so to speak. So creating more rapport with the leadership around the goals? Uh, yeah, that, that's, that'd be a good, a good start. Um, and then for me, it's a lot of new business and, and bringing in new relationships for us to work with that I'm starting over in a lot of ways because that book of business previously is, is not necessarily what it is now. Um, so what, what, what is the goal then? Like, I mean, so creating more rapport with leaders, you're feeling like there's yep. something that's, is, so, is, are you so, feeling like there's something that's not possible right now? Or is it just like, you're looking, like you've been kind of going along steadily and you're looking for like, what's that next? Yeah, so, so for me, I think uh, two main goals, one being what we refer to bluntly as new business. And um, my goal that is achievable is, is less than they think is achievable. So part of that is proving myself this year of bringing in uh, relationships, but then also being involved in the community and being out and about is we do it in a different way now and to a less extent than I have done for the past 10 years. So how to how to help help them see the impact of being out and about networking nonprofit more so than other colleagues may currently do. So helping them see what you're doing, even though it looks different than it used to look. Yes, that's the short way to say what I said over five minutes. Yes, ma'am. Well, I mean, this is, you know, it's a really perfect example because so often, one of the one of the biggest challenges is figuring out what exactly the goal is, right? Like once you know what you want to do, it's easier to do it, right? <laughs> but just defining it, I think that's a challenge pretty much everybody has, you know, at least sometimes. So um, 
I mean, this is, so I guess I'm torn because I feel like this, this is, a, this is kind of go, is going a little bit of a different direction and I'm happy to engage with this and I'm just not sure, you know, um, I mean, like what's, I mean, it kind of takes us away from like, okay, what's the, what's the value and then how do you, you know, sort of segue that into something else. Um, but yeah, and if and if and if you and I can connect offline, that's fine too. I don't. I want to use everybody's time. Wisely. Yeah, I mean, I'd be, I'd be happy to talk to you more about it. I'm just. I feel like it might be taking us in a slightly different direction. Um, but it's but it's a great example, right? Like this is what we're do doing. Everyone. Some people their their challenges are more directly COVID focused. Other people, it's just kind of the normal life things. Right, so continuing on, you change jobs, and this is you know the challenges, um, or the challenges in the new environment, all, all hey, of that Chris, stuff. Can I um, interject for a minute, please? Um, hey, um, Nathan, I wanted to kind of speak to that because I have been in those shoes, um, almost the exact same, and I've found that the more open communication you have with that leadership and the more confidence you have in yourself and in what you bring to the table and you kind of value yourself as an equal to them it brings so much more respect on their side for you that they see you as bringing so much to the table and they'll be so thankful that they have you on their team that they'll kind of take your ideas and a new way of thinking in a a more serious tone than versus you kind of being afraid to say, oh, well, this is what we used to do. This is what I used to do. And instead just being like, well, I mean, have you ever thought about doing it this way instead? Because I've found a lot of success with it. And like, why don't we try doing it this way for just a little bit? And if it doesn't work out, then that's fine. Um, so that's kind of what I found with new leadership and moving in a new environment or starting out in a new completely new area that's kind of what I I think is super helpful just starting off with a lot of confidence <laughs> yeah and you know that that's great Amber and it sounds like you may have identified or at least a potential right like I don't know what the the core value that you were looking for or sort of the, the core thematic thing that may be there for Nathan but one possibility certainly is around confidence, right? Like feeling confident in this new environment and, and all of that, right? So that's, that's great. Um, does anyone else have something that they'd uh, be willing? <laughs> I know it takes a little bit of courage <laughs> to share these kinds of things in front of the group. And I really appreciate everybody speaking up. Does anyone have you know, a goal that you're thinking that you wanted to achieve and that you're trying to figure out how to, you know, shift it to something practical for the moment? I can go. Um, so I actually just moved to Knoxville back at the end of September. Um, so pretty new to the area. My wife and I moved from Cincinnati and you know, really looking to how to get a goal for us is to really become involved and to really make Knoxville our place in our city. And that, you know, exactly how that looks, especially now, um, it's much harder to go out and meet people, to get involved in different opportunities because mm -hmm. we're not, it's not like, oh, let's go to, I mean, whether that's church or sports events or things like that, everything that you look at, you think, well, is that a good idea? Should we be doing that? Um, so I think, you know, that's a, a goal for us that really don't know how to approach it, especially given the, the current environment. Thanks. That's such a great example, right? Like you move to a new place, you want to get involved. So, and it seems impossible. I mean, maybe not impossible, but certainly trickier at the very least. Absolutely. So for you, and it may be different for your wife, but just for you, since you're the one here, um, what do you think is the core, what's the thing about being involved that matters most to you, right? Is it about 
kind of the sense of community, like sort of just being known, like knowing others and being known? Is it about creating um, kind of specific kinds of opportunities? Is it about, you know, making friends, which is a bit different, right? Like friendship versus sort of more general community. Is it about, right? Like there's a lot of different things. Right. Other people can feel free to speak up if you have, if you see something or have an idea. Um, yeah, I would say it's, it's twofold. There's two major things out of it. You know, one I think is you're kind of going that friends angle is more to have that community that you can lean on, especially when you have times like this. But I think there's also that of being able to give back and feeling like what you are, I mean, not maybe not as much as saying like your life matters, but also being able to have that opportunity to give back and not be as passive in life as, you know, potentially have been up to this point. So you can truly say like, Okay, here's value that I'm adding to other people, no matter how that looks. What's a way that you might enjoy adding value? Like maybe something that you've done at other times or that you just know you like? Yeah, uh, started to look into like mentoring programs um, was something that started to the people that I work with. Um, at Epic Nine, very involved in, in nonprofits and things like that. So, uh, like, for example, something I'm going to try to do is the Maryville High School had like some business students come to a, a blunt chamber event. So I reached out to the person who leads that class and said, like, hey, I'd be more than happy to talk to the students and kind of be able to, you know, at, at 25 right now to be able to give some advice if here's some things I would do differently here's some things I wouldn't do um I've not had the opportunity to do that yet but the idea is to help other people's path potentially be easier because of the things that I've experienced that's so great right so I think the things that really help you turn is kind of these sort of goals into a really meaningful project something that is more than just like oh I have this vague intention, I'm good, you know, which is great. Like there's nothing wrong with any of it, but what kind of the next level um, when appropriate is, so the project, right? It starts with the core value, right? Like you want to, you want to give back and really contribute and be an integral part of this community, right? right. So that's sort of the fundamental thing. So you, it sounds like you're pretty solid around that. You might tweak it at some point, but sounds pretty good. Um, and it sounds like it's already also building on your strengths, right? Like maybe speaking is comfortable for you or, you know, like these different things that you, you're you already kind of good at navigating some of these things. So that's another place you want to look is because you can say something, say like, oh, I want to do this thing. But if it like, you know, with my example, with the reading, right, reading books, like some people don't really like reading books. Right, like if they came up with that, it would not be a great idea because it's not building on the things that already, you know, they're already kind of good at, mm -hmm. right, or that they already really like. So it sounds like you're you're doing a great job of doing it that way, and it's something that really matters to you. So the final thing just to look at as you're as you're considering this is how to make it like how you bring it to the next level, right? Not that everything has to be next level, but just as you're contemplating, you know, like so sort of left to your own devices normally, maybe you would stop at you know, one of these places, like you would stop at, okay, I'm, you know, giving, uh, you know, uh, talking at schools or whatever, right? But maybe it's a matter of recruiting 25 people to talk at a bunch of schools or something like that. It's like another way to, it enhances the community. You become known as a person who creates this, right? Like it's a way of creating more connection. So it's just, just offering another thing to add to the mix as you're thinking about you know, as you're thinking about this, if you choose to think about this as a project. No, I think, I think that's great to not just be like, okay, I've achieved some level of that success. And so boom, that's goals checked off, but how can you take that and expand upon that more? So thank you. I appreciate that.
Sure. I mean, and not like it's a lot easier to go speak at schools than it used to be, right? <laughs> like it takes an hour as opposed to taking, you know, whatever, take, you know, you have to get the time off of work and right. So in, in some ways there's a lot, we, we've all discovered there's things that are easier during the pandemic and who knows, this could be one of them in a certain way. Absolutely. So thank you for being an example. And I know we're, we've gone over time. So I just wanted to say uh, it's been lovely being with all of you. Um, I'll send the slides to Amber who can send them out. And uh, I just was figured I'd end with a quote. If you don't like the road you're walking, start paving another one from Dolly Parton, which I feel like is very appropriate in our current situation. And it's appropriate for Knoxville because Dolly Parton is like everyone's idol in Knoxville. So <laughs> even more so, right? That was already in the presentation. It wasn't even tailored to you guys. It's just perfect. It's just <laughs> perfect for these situations. Um, I'm happy to stick around if anyone wanted to chat further. Um, if not, uh, have a good rest of your day. Well, thank you so much. Hi, Anna. We really appreciate it. Um, if everyone wants to stick around for like a couple minutes. Cody, uh, Cody Barnes is going to have some announcements for the group for West Under 40 and just give you guys an update of uh, what's next. All right. Thank you so much, Anna, for your great presentation. It was very insightful and rarely do I feel like I learn from Zoom calls and you've get definitely given me things to ponder. So I appreciate that. Um, we are starting the year out by doing an event every month this year for West Under 40. Um, so next month is still going to be virtual. We're treading lightly with in-person and trying to let people get a settle for the year. And um, so February's event, we have yet to officially set the date, but it is going to be more of a networking format. And in order to stay connected with us, if you want to follow us on the Chamber website, and also join our Facebook group that we've started. We are trying to be active on there and have some more group discussions, such as posting questions that we would have asked Anna um, prior to the meeting starting. So if you wanna join us there, it's a great informative place. And also I know that um, the board was introduced earlier, but I just wanna give a shout out to everyone, Adrian Hall, Natasha Bohannon, uh, Chloe Poole, Kaylor Hensley, Amber Martinez, myself, Cody Barnes, and Jared Butler, or Julie Blaylock herself. If any of you have any questions about the West Under 40 or future events or even recommendations that you have, please reach out to any of us. We would love to talk to you. Thank you. All right, guys, if anyone has any questions or wants to have some one-on-one -on -one time, more one-on-one -on -one time with Anna, uh, feel free to snag her in the chat and and she can stick around. But um, if, if, it, if everybody's good to go, then we will see you guys at the West Under 40 Facebook page and at our next event. So keep an eye out for what's to come. And we are super excited for 2021, no matter what it's going to look like, no matter what it's going to look like on the news or feel like. Uh, this is a safe place for all of us to come and enjoy each other and, and support each other's businesses so and each, other, and each other personally. So that's really why we wanted to have this event. So we're super excited for, for this year. All Great right. events. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Colby. Thank you.